Dr. Richard C. Miller, I started Myth Vision, named the channel Myth Vision, because I started noticing things about Jesus that looked like myth with my vision. And people have noticed I was a mythicist who thought Jesus did not exist, uh, didn't know, but had a high, high suspicion for good reasons to think that didn't happen and that didn't happen and that didn't happen. <laughs> So I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm real close with Robert Price. I am reading Richard Carrier. I am aware of mythicist argumentation, read on the historicity multiple times. I, um, I really had this idea of Jesus' existence, probably not the case. Okay. Um, and I wanted to know the origins of Christianity. So I, I, I'm spinning this onto you because you're not a consensus argument guy that, oh, well, Everyone else poo-poo's the idea that Jesus didn't exist, so we're off. It's off the table. You you kind of look at it, and go consensus be damned. That does not draw my conclusion. I'll make my own mind up on what I do. Right. I I know as my openings here are long, but it's a conversation, and I think this is important to kind of emphasize. I personally drew the conclusion there was probably a guy now, for simple reasons, and some of those simple reasons are in Paul's letters, Jesus is crucified. It says he's born of a woman. I know that that term, genomai, can mean manufacture. But my wife made my kids. That meant she birthed them. And I just said she made them. But you know what I mean. So yeah. it can be interchangeable to mean birth or made. He's of the seed of David, uh, descended genealogically in some way. He's, try he's trying to tie him into David. I, th I imagine Jews did this a lot. Uh, I'm from so-and-so. I'm uh, genealogically finding a way to have pedigree. So I read this and I went, man, Philo talks about Jews being crucified by Romans. Josephus, without a doubt, crucified by Romans. Here's Paul talking about Jesus, crucified. Now, mythicists will argue and try to show, oh, not by Romans. It doesn't say by Romans. It says by archons or it says by this. And t typically, I would imagine if you don't want your head to be cut off, you may not blame Romans uh, very openly in your letters. I don't know and cannot prove that. Okay. But... It may me go that makes more sense than the celestial model. I'm throwing what I think. What do you think? Do you think there was a guy? Um, are you sympathetic toward mythicism as an academic? I just asked Carl Ruck, and when I get back from this trip, I'm interviewing him. He thinks it's all a story. This okay. is PhD, Harvard, Carl Ruck, who's a philologist. This guy like knows he wrote apples of... He wrote all sorts of stuff about this. He thinks this is a story. What are your thoughts on this? And how do you think Christianity started? Oh, well, yeah. I, I, first, I'd like to say that it's upsetting that that perspective that Jesus did not exist at all is being lampooned and uh, being driven to the margins. Those that take that view are being pushed off of any kind of legitimate seat at the table. Uh, in terms of what uh, the, the theories that are going to be taken the most seriously in the field. That to me is, is uh, an abuse of power. It's inappropriate. Um, at some point, someone this, this chock full of myth and legend in their story, there's only two possible outcomes to that. Either he was whole cloth myth, in other words, all story, like, you're, like this professor is, is telling you, or there's some kernel of something behind it, but not enough there to really determine the narrative. And so those are the two options. I guess you can add a third that he that that that, that Peter Pan really did exist and did all these things, and you could end up with this kind of absurd construct that I think is popularized by you know some modern literalists. I think that's off the table in terms of some of the other videos that you've done with me. Okay. Right. So if we've only got two legitimate secular positions to take on this at this point, that either he's almost he's he's all but entirely myth and legend with some little tiny kernel at the bottom of that, like the, yeah, there was a guy named Jesus, and maybe we can connect the dots on four or five things there and walk away. Um, or no, let's just let go of all that altogether, and we've got a whole cloth kind of invented story. Okay. If those are the only two legitimate perspectives on the table, then those should be the only two legitim legitimated perspectives in the field. 
Okay, and that's not what's going on, and we've talked about that in prior videos. And so my perspective on this is I give camaraderie to those that take another view, and that is the mythicist view. I am regarded as a mythicist as well. If you go searching, and I've, I've done this a couple of times, search for my name and see what are people thinking of me, you know, out in the big world of things. I've seen my name sort of just kind of stuck right in the same slot along with Carrier and Price, and you go down the list, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not ashamed of that. I think it, it sort of obscures some distinctions there between our positions, but Richard Carey and I have talked about that, and I respect where he's coming from. He respects where I'm coming from. I believe that we're kind of talking, we're 95% talking about a lot of the same stuff. And I appreciate the fact that he's trying to drive, that he has driven this thesis, even to the point of being mistreated by the field, even he's carried it forward. And he's the, he's uniquely qualified for that in terms of his personality to put up with an atrocity really of mistreatment by the field. And so that's my perspective on it. I know it's more complicated than that, but my perspective on it is we've got a qualified historian that's coming into the discourse, highly qualified, arguably more qualified than most of the people that pretend to know what they're talking about in this field, because he is a specifically trained in the rigors of historiography in, in antiquity uh, or, or historical historiographical work regarding ancient time. And so, He's been trained by the best in the world at the best place, two of the best places in the world. And he is uniquely qualified in that way, at least equally qualified to be at the table with a, a legitimate perspective on this topic. And I appreciate that. Uh, my perspective is that if the historical Jesus did exist, but he was all but irrelevant to the composition of the gospels. In fact, even in the way, and so uh, that's my perspective on it. And we can unpack why and what. I think all of the layer cake of, you know, literary um, intentionality, the templating of different mimetic models, the effort to paint him with the, within these theological kind of charged topics and the, the sorts of things that they're trying to achieve in, in mythologizing him, that there, we've got a text that is from beginning to end, you know, a set of texts beginning to end that are chock full of legend, folk belief, myth, all the way across the board. You know, this idea then that we, that, that somewhere behind that, we need to have this pilgrimage to, that if we interrogate the text long enough, maybe the historical man will step forward and present himself and introduce himself. It's not gonna happen. That's not going to happen. You're never going to know what that guy was like. But all we do know is for certain from our from the standpoint of secular academics is he was not what did the, the New Testament Gospels are not footage of any flesh and blood person that, that it actually existed in history. And so can I can yeah. I press a little here? Yeah. You said that the Jesus that you think probably existed is honestly irrelevant and he gets in the way. And something, I, I, I got to praise you on this because this has been my recent conclusion where I'm at right now. I change my mind all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not omniscient for you viewers. <laughs> um, I know you like to think I am, but uh, I'm just kidding. So the, the idea that this is even that important of a question among the two camps that are to be legitimately considered, I find that that's almost like a tribalistic, it's like almost like, the apologetic world wants that battle mm. between both of the legitimate possible camps. Because while I don't find personally the conclusion of the celestial model of Jesus that, that Richard paints, I don't rule out the possibility of the story model that you hear Ruck say. Ruck doesn't go into the whole celestial thing as much as he says, I think it's just a story. Kind of like Hercules is just a story. Or Asclepius yeah. is just a story. There's stories about this. Could there have been a guy? Maybe. We have totally lost him. And I would go so far as to say Romulus, where we're pretty confident that guy never even existed at all. Thank but he's you. painted like a guy who did exist at some point in the past. Yeah. I understand it's a distant past. And this is where the argument for historicists want to come in. Well, Jesus is in the distant, distant past. That's assuming a legend can't build, to, build up in a few days or weeks or years or something. So right. I want to push it back on you, press you to say, yeah. do you think the question is wrongheaded? Is it really something worth dying on the hill over with the two camps? 
No, in fact, uh, so my, my own published work, what I try to do, is, rather than Jesus myth theorist or Christ myth theorist and, you know, traditional, what are they, what, they're trying to draw that line. There's those guys, let's cut that out, you know, and then there's everyone else who are mainstream or whatever, and then maybe some radicals on the other end. So that's the way they're slicing kind of the discursive pie. I think that's a false way to, to slice it. What I'd like to, the, a different term, a namespace I'd like to popularize, or at least the one that I use when I write, is a myth critic. This is somebody who's interrogating or investigating the New Testament and unpacking its mythologies. And it just so happens that that is an extensive project that pretty much covers it from end to end. And so that, to me, that's a shared project. We're starting from very, we have very similar projects then across that entire, so there is not that line. Maybe one says that it's 100% myth and another one says that it's 95 or whatever. Okay, and maybe there's a range there, but there's a whole bunch of scholars that fit in that world that have a whole lot to gain from one another. And that discourse needs to be happening. And so I think, you know, the professor you're talking about uh, that's talking about it being story, that that person deserves a seat at the table. Carrier deserves a seat at the table. McDonald deserves one. Perhaps even Litwa, myself, other figures that are out here trying to do serious academic work or that's tr that are serious about that question and not trying to create a you know something that would be useful to belief systems in the modern world but just trying to answer it from the best of our knowledge mm -hmm. in, in honesty regarding you know what if anything here is historically reliable i would say it misses the point the gospels are not data for that project um, we're God. looking, <laughs> it's like finding out, let's pretend there was some x-ray of the earth and we knew this area had diamonds. Yeah. Um, but this area over here literally had no minerals at all. And we're trying to go over here to find historical diamonds where there's no diamonds. And you're right. saying that mining the non-diamond regions of the Gospels to find that his historicity or historical kernel yeah. is futile. It's a fool's errand. And if you go to SBL, you'll see it in giant, and I'm sure I'm upsetting someone that's watching this right now that's, that finds that dear, but you'll say a giant session with hundred, perhaps hundreds of people in there trying to explore this question. Try, they're on a pilgrimage. I would call it a religious faith-based pilgrimage in some way. Even though they're, they're discounting pieces of Jesus, they're still trying to get to that, that, that holy man at the bottom of it all, trying to get down to the kernel, that, 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 the founding figure. They're trying to derive that. It's an academic pilgrimage that's rooted in an obsession with finding the originary kernel and the tradition, which you can go back to even Martin Luther and others that are just digging further to try and get down. If you could just get down to the core, the original gospel, the original guy, that must be the real one. That's the one that's the authority behind all of this. And uh, I, I see that as a fool's errand. And so um, now I love Albert Schweitzer. I love going back and reading him. And I think it was a daring pioneer in certain ways and regarding that. Um, not the first, of course, but in his wave of work along with others, it's exciting what was going on there. But in the end, I find it to be ill-conceived really. So we now kind of situated your personal perspective, but we've also uh, want to remove some of the tribalistic religious dogma arguing, oh, you're mythicist, I can't listen to you. Um, I, I personally would like to encourage those who are mythicists to also be more flexible to those who are like me, who in no way thinks this is divine or true. And, and don't, just because I think there was probably a guy, I'm not your enemy. And I, I want to encourage anyone who might think that, vice versa, I hope that you would do the same. Thank we you. can yeah. create the unity we, we should have. And if we do have common ground, it's the magical Jesus is not true. And I am a magical Jesus mythicist. I am a, that Jesus is not true. There is no Jesus that existed that did any of that stuff. So in that sense, I'm a mythicist. So we have common ground. We need to have that. Getting into the origins question, wow, do books sell off of the shelves of like, how did Christianity begin? And, and the or the true origins of Christianity, even Robin Faith Walsh, when I did her recent course, which I haven't edited and put up yet, maybe it's up by now, I don't know, when you're watching this, she's like, mm, this is hard because origins of Christianity, like that's speculation, trying to figure that out. 
What do you speculate? Now you're taking off oops, you're taking off your rigorous academic goggles. You're taking yeah. off the like you're you're using them to get as close as you think, but now you're kind of taking a guess. And the guess is, what do you think happened, Dr. Miller, that started this cult? Oh well, yeah. So I, I would say that there was probably some, there was a charismatic figure back there uh, at some point that had a following of some kind, not as big as John the Baptist movement, obscure by comparison. Maybe they were even cousins, as it says in there. I don't know. I think the baptizer was a real historical person. I know that maybe some of the people you have on your show would disagree with that. And uh, I'm fine with that too. I don't, it doesn't change my life one way or the other. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think that basically you've got an apocalyptic. It seems like some, you know, John Kloppenberg may be a, a, a good informing voice on this. And you've got this apocalyptic movement early on. Maybe, maybe you've got a cynic philosopher kind of layer there. You know, he's dealing with Q and some of these early constructions there. Um, I would defer to someone like, uh, you know, Dennis McDonald. I would even defer to the mythicists. You know, they're they're doing something important here in terms of trying to uh, their, their heuristic project is how can, how far can we explain this without presuming that there was a historical figure behind mm -hmm. it all? Mm -hmm. And we're shocked at how far they can go with that. And some of that has been deeply insightful. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would say that there was some sort of a, an apocalyptic figure there that was uh, that that. There was some sort of, he upset some people in that. Uh, he was a radical in some ways and he got executed and he had followers. Um, beyond that, in terms of, you know, and I think the, he was without honor. Just like it says in the God, no prophet is without honor, except for in his own kind of, except for in Judea and, and, and Nazareth and all these, he, he was without honor there in, the, in his original context. Uh, we once knew him as a flesh and blood person, as as uh, Paul says, Paul yeah. Paul claims there, and I I think that yeah, there even though he never quotes the guy, I mean, it wasn't terribly relevant, I guess. Like you would think you would find by the, I, Price and others have brought this up. Why wouldn't we find, given the ethical questions that are being ad, uh, addressed in Paul's letters, why wouldn't we find anecdotes and quotations from Jesus routinely meeting us in the pages of Paul, if that figure was at all relevant right. to his project. Not uh, relevant. It, that's a, that's a very low bar. I mean, you would say he is the Christ. He's the most heralded and signified figure in the Paul, Paul's idea, right? This is the, the figurehead of the movement. And yet there's a conspicuous absence of any kind of interest in what that individual may have actually said in, in time and space. So it is like a guessing game really to know exactly what anything really, ha how it really happened and what is the case. And that is, that is really the case of what we're dealing with. Um, I guess, you know, I like what you said there, but I, if I was to push back, to push back devil's advocate, yeah. you mentioned John the Baptist, you mentioned um, uh, Q. Here we are at the Gospels again, the fool's errand of trying to find the historical Jesus. Thank you. To, you yeah. Know, so, so if I were a mythicist listening to you, I'd go, dude, you just told us we could, what are we going to go to the Gospels? <laughs> Thank but you. Then you go to the Gospels to make John the Baptist a point. But Josephus does mention John the Baptist. I tend to think this guy's real. And I do think that yeah. they, they, they're even making, I think the Gospels are even doing things with John that you're not finding that the historical John the Baptist may have actually done here. No, no, I, so, I agree with you. That's, it, you know, he, we're not getting the historical, this is not footage of anything. Right. You know, yeah. so it's like, are we, are we, what are we doing? You know, like, what no, the heck is going on here? I agree. And so uh, in terms of the Q thing, I mean, I, I, I myself am, am, I wouldn't say fully agnostic on it, but my work does not depend on any, any kind of particular position on, on Q. It's, right. it's a debated, I honestly think that this has gone on for so long just demonstrate that there's a, a very messy relationship between these texts and we're not going to get to the bottom of that I'm and so you. yeah and i and i don't need to i already i could already with my own methodological tools understand how these texts would have registered in their final form and within the communities where they got traction and, and meant something and so but behind that you can see some fairly primitive kind of identity identity formation 
uh, parts that first become visible in Matthew, whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it Q and a textual document, it's fine. If you want to, you know, go with Farr's hypothesis and Goodacre and all those guys that are trying to put together a different hypothesis, that's fine too. My, my hypothesis doesn't necessarily, to me, it's a fool's errand. You're, it's not that, not necessarily the reconstruction of Q being a fool's errand, but the idea that you're going to somehow get to the bottom of a historical figure down in there. If there is one, it's those earliest, most primitive layers. We get the same thing with Shakyamuni Buddha. You know, if you start reading the Tripitaka and try to understand who the historical figure was, the earliest you can get back to are these sayings that go back, they seem very primitive. And they, this is as close as we can get. But you have to throw up your hands and say, you know, I'm sorry, we can't get there. Not a satisfying answer for Jesus and dogmatic theology. And since I'm not doing that, it's not that important to me. Um, I, but I do think that that figure, the best textual evidence that I could see is in the way often, irrelevant often, and not the object of the gospel portraitures. Thank you. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision. Coming in the air tonight.